for now. So welcome to the second day of the uh, uh, Wombat 2021. And uh, it's my great pleasure to be the chair and to introduce Regina Baracci, who's one of our colleagues, uh, long time colleagues and a, and a very uh, um, you know, accomplished mathematician. And, and certainly uh, her talk will be very much in, the, in, in line with the theme of this workshop. She's going to talk about generalized Bregman distances, which given that Bregman distances are generalizations of distances, this could be quite interesting, I think. So take it away, Regina. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for your kind words and put another generalization to generalize Bregman distance because this is going to be a further generalization to the classical Bregman distances. So this, I, I will start by mentioning the classical definition and recalling very well-known examples very quickly and going right to the two definitions that we are going to see. So we are going to see two types of generalization. One generalization involves one arbitrary maximally monotone operator, which is the first definition that we are going to see. And the second definition is a definition that involves two maps, T and S, only one of them maximally monotone and the other any point to set map with several properties. So we are going to produce these generalized definitions. And I hope that I will be able to convince you that these definitions are not a generalization just for generalizing, but they may have some computational interest, both, both from, the, from the point of view of solving variational problems and also some computational interest as well. Okay, so this, this uh, talk is based on an original paper with Juan Enrique. Uh, Juan Enrique was the first one who proposed me to work on this. And I must say that the original idea of Juan Enrique is the basis of this paper, of this generalization. And, and then by, by speaking, by seeing a talk given by Min and Scott some years ago, I proposed to them to use this generalized Bregman distances that we defined with Juan Enrique to use them in envelopes or to study coercivity properties and this is what generated two papers with Min and Scott. So let's go back to the classical definition of a Bregman distance. So the, the definition of a Bregman distance requires, so the first main ingredient is a convex function, which is strictly convex, so not only convexity, but it requires strict, it requires strict convexity and differentiability. So you have a a gradient, which is a single point. And the primal point of view of the Bregman distance, so when you look at the Bregman distance and you think of it as a primal object, is the difference between the value of f at the point x, so this value here, and the value of a linear approximation at the point y. And this difference is non-negative. So this is the, the linear approximation. Now, the remarkable fact is that by choosing several types of strictly convex functions, you can generate very important types of distances. So the Bregman distance, the classical Bregman distance is extremely useful. Even if you don't depart from it, you can use it in many occasions and these are three examples in which, which show how fundamental and important the classical Bregman distance is. Now let's look at the Bregman distance from a dual point of view. And let's introduce the fenchel yang equality, which was mentioned by Javier Peña yesterday in his talk. So he used the, the fenchel yang equality, which, which allows us to replace the scalar product between the gradient of f at y and y. And using that replacement, it gives us an equivalent expression of the Bregman distance as the difference of this function here. This is the function, let's say, h of x and gradient of f of y. 
And this function h is a function that has one variable, one, one foot, let's say, in the primal space and another foot in the dual space. So this is the function that we have, and we compute the difference with the scalar product. And the facial diag system, which I will write down in a few slides again, tells us that this distance is equal to zero <coughs> if and only if the gradient of f at x coincides with the gradient of f at y. So if we think of the gradient as a maximally monotone operator, the condition here is a dual condition requesting that the image of your maximal monotone operator on the original reference points x and y should coincide. So when we look at this distance, we see that this is really a distance between the images of a fixed operator at the reference points x and y. So this is how we want to look at this distance because in the moment in which we realize that this is the maximally monotone operator and that we realize that this is a convex function in the product space, then we can introduce maximally monotone operators into the framework of Bregman distances. So just to express the facial the, the facial young property in a clear way. And I want everybody to remember this today. So this is the facial young system that says that at every pair of points XV, at every primal dual pair XV, this convex function, which is defined in the product space, is going to be greater than the scalar product. And when you stand in the graph of the operator gradient of f, you have equality. So this means that this convex function not only is a convex function that satisfies this property, but also it uniquely defines the operator by this property. So you can see, you can understand what the operator is just by looking at the values of this function and compare it with the scalar product. By doing that comparison, you will understand whether you are standing at the graph or not. But of course you would say, yes, this is something that holds for the gradient and this convex function. So this is a relationship between the gradient and the convex function f plus f star. So this is a convex function. Can we, how can we extend this property to an arbitrary maximally monotone operator? Can we find functions that have the similar property with respect to the graph of the operator T? And this is precisely what the family H of T, which is called now the Fitzpatrick family of T does. So the Fitzpatrick family is a family of convex functions which was studied formally in a paper together with Bernard Schweiter almost 20 years ago, which says that for every maximally monotone operator T, you can define a family H of T that, that verifies precisely the Fenchelian system. So in the sense that it is everywhere greater than the scalar product and exactly equal to the scalar product when your pair XV belongs to the graph of T. This means that by, by measuring the difference between the function and XV, you can understand whether your point is or not in the graph of the operator. And in the particular case in, in which the operator T is the subdifferential of F or the gradient of F, then as we have observed, F plus F star is an element of the Fitzpatrick family associated with this operator, right? So this means that we can and we should extend to 
the framework of maximally monotone operators, the concept of the classical Bregman distance. But let's look a little bit more to, let's look a little bit more at this family, at this Fitzpatrick family. So in 1988, in fact, Fitzpatrick defined a function, which is now called the Fitzpatrick function, which satisfies the property that is everywhere less than the scalar product. And it is exactly equal to the scalar product if and only if your V is in T of X. So this means that this function, this Fitzpatrick function belongs to, so Fitzpatrick function belongs to the Fitzpatrick family, let's say, as it's logical, right? And uh, it's easy to see that this, that the monotonicity and the maximality of T imply that the Fitzpatrick function belongs to the family. So in the same way, and here this is a beautiful fact, in the same way as convexity implies, and it's equivalent to the fact that the classical Bregman distance is non-negative, in the same way, maximal monotonicity ensures that this function f of t minus the scalar product is always going to be non-negative. So the non-negativity of the difference between this function in the family h of t and the scalar product is inherent to the maximal monotonicity of t. So this tells you how fundamental it is, maximal monotonicity in the basic idea of Bregman, Bregman, Bregman distances. So as I mentioned to you, the Fitzpatrick function is one element of the family H of T. And moreover, Fitzpatrick showed in 1988 that it's the smallest element in the family. So he didn't define the family formally. The formal definition was presented in 2002, but he mentioned, he mentioned that amongst all the convex function that satisfy the facial young system, this, this function, the Fitzpatrick function was going to be the smallest one. He showed, he, he showed that. And not only that, the, this is the smallest element and the largest element is the convex conjugate of the Fitzpatrick function. So somehow this, this is the, the reason for which this is called the Fitzpatrick family because Every element in this family is either is, is between the Fitzpatrick function and it's, it's larger than the Fitzpatrick function and smaller than the conjugate of the Fitzpatrick function. And the conjugate is something that is almost everywhere plus infinity with the exception of the convex hull of the graph of the operator. So again, is the the largest possibility, the largest possible convex function that you can get that will satisfy the Fenchel Young system. So this is this is what I wanted to say regarding the Fitzpatrick family. And I I hope that I convince yourself that you will you may find many elements in this family. So let's go again. So the Fitzpatrick family then is the set of all functions that satisfy this property and uh, they characterize the graph of the operator T. So this means that by taking the difference between H at XV and the scalar product, we will get a non-negative expression. But because T is a point to set mapping, we have the choice of either, take, either taking the supremum for every V in T of I, of the corresponding difference of these two functions or the infimum of these differences. If we take the supremum, then we call this the sharp version. If we take the infimum, we call this the flat version. And this notation, sharp and flat, is inspired by a paper of Christoph Kiewiel, who used this for defining a generalization of the classical Bregman distance to the non-differentiable case. So when instead of having the gradient of F, you have a subdifferential, 
Therefore, you are faced with the situation of taking the supremum or the infimum, and he used this notation sharp and flat in his paper. So that's, we are following that notation now. And note that this gives us so many degrees of freedom when defining our distance, because not only we have now any maximally monotone operator T, but we also can choose any function H in this Fitzpatrick family, and we do have a Bregman distance which will make sense, right? So this gives us a whole new world of distances. And what I mentioned to you is that, why is this a generalization of the classical Bregman distance? Because if you take your T, the gradient, and your function, the differential Young function, then unless some pathological points in the boundary of the domain of the gradient, you will get the equality with the classical Bregman distance. So the, in that sense, we recover the classical definition. Okay, but of course, now we have a lot more choices on, in our hand. For example, instead of choosing the fencil Young function, which is F plus F star, we can choose, sorry, that would be if the operator T is the gradient, but you can choose T an arbitrary maximally monotone operator. So you depart from the classical definition, which requires to have a convex function. So you don't need to have a convex function anymore. You can work with an arbitrary maximally monotone operator. And in that case, of course, because in the case of having a maximally monotone operator, you don't have the fenchel Young function because the fenchel Young, you only have it when you have the gradient or when you have the sub differential. But when you have an arbitrarily maximally monotone operator, for sure you can use the Fitzpatrick function. And in that case, you generate the two versions, the sharp and flat, of what we can call the Fitzpatrick distance, which uses the particular choice of H as the Fitzpatrick distance. Where again, this is the definition of the Fitzpatrick distance. Now let's look at what happens when we get, when we use T equal the gradient of F, and when we compare with, for, for that case, instead of using the facial Young function, which will be F plus F star, we use the Fitzpatrick function associated with the gradient of F. So let's look at the classical situation. So, Suppose that we have the negative bulk entropy, which is minus log T, is a function which is convex, and we have that it's strictly convex and differentiable for T positive. So of course you can define a Bregman, a classical Bregman distance associated with this function. And then instead of use, if you, instead of using the Fenchelian function, you use the Fitzpatrick function, then you get this distance, which is very nice distance in the, in the sense that now you have a, the effective domain of your distance becomes larger because the effective domain of the classical Bregman distance can only admit strictly positive variables as domain. But now the new domain of this Fitzpatrick distance is larger in the sense that you can extend, you can have finite expression up to the boundary of the original domain. And in this computation, we used a paper by Bauske, McLaren, and Sendov that provides a very rich calculations of many examples of Fitzpatrick functions. And the same paper is the paper that we used in this other example, in which we look at the kullback leibler entropy which is another case of a very famous classical Bregman distance in which of course you are using the fenchel Young function, but if instead of using the fenchel Young function, you obtain a different distance in the non-negative or tank again. And by looking at this distance, 
we used the, as I mentioned before, you used the, the, the existing computation in the literature of the Fitzpatrick, this Fitzpatrick function. And this, uh, this computation is very beautiful from here. It uses the inverse of the map that maps T to T to the ET, which is the so-called Lambert W functions, which has a lot of applications in complex analysis and in numerical analysis. And in fact, by using the fact that this distance is always less than or equal the distance that uses the Fenchel-Liang distance, we obtain a new inequality involving the Lambert W function. So who would have thought of that? Now, the, the, the next part of the talk is regarding the use of envelopes in mathematics. So we, we many times regularize a given function and we use a distance to make the function more regular, to make it having minimizers or to make the solution of the this minimization problem easier right so this type of regularization is is used uh, in variational analysis for example for variational inequalities or for finding zeros of sums of maximal Newton operators so this is what we what we call the moro envelope and of course, a natural generalization of this distance, which incorporates some new flavor, is the Bregman replacing the classical quadratic distance by a Bregman distance. You obtain what are called Bregman prox envelopes. And the Bregman prox envelopes have similar properties as the Moreau envelopes. So they use, they approach the function from below when, when gamma tends to zero, they approach the function from below. And it is interesting to see what happens when instead of using this classical Bregman regularization, we use these new distances in our regularization. And this produces, for example, this produces what we can call the Fitzpatrick Brox envelope, when this distance uses the Fitzpatrick function. Or more generally, when you go ahead and use many other distances, that, I mean, not necessarily with the gradient there, you have now a lot more degrees of freedom to choose. You don't need to choose a gradient of F here. You can choose an arbitrary maximally monotone operator T, which is point to set, and therefore you will have sharp and flat versions of it. And you can choose any function H that you would like to choose. So this would give you a more general type of envelope. And it's interesting to study the properties of this envelope, not only because they give you so many other possibilities, but also this will tell you which are the fundamental properties of the existing envelopes that are used in the generation of the theoretical results. Because by going more and more and more general, you understand which are the properties that you can do without and still get everything that you had before. So the, the first result regarding asymptotic behavior is when gamma tends to zero. So when gamma tends to zero, we, we we come out when the parameter, the regularization parameter mu here in the denominator tends to zero, it means that the term corresponding to the distance becomes more and more prominent, right? And uh, these are the assumptions that, that we will make. So of course, we require the convexity of theta, proper lower semi-continuous, and some situation of the domains just to have the functions defined, well-defined in the sets. And to ensure existence of the solutions, we require that the perturbed function is coercive for some choice of mu positive. And then because of the coercivity property, we can ensure the existence, <clears throat> the existence of S gamma for gamma tending to zero, the existence of a minimizer. 
And the results tells us that when gamma tends to zero, the generalized distance between the minimizers and the reference point y also tends to zero. And this is, this is from the fact that when gamma tends to zero, then the distance is what becomes more prominent, right? So this is what is going to go to zero. And now what more can be said? So the, the results, in order to obtain the classic, the, the results that exist in the literature, we require that T to be strictly monotone. So look at the case, think of T being the gradient of F. So being T strictly monotone means that F is strictly convex, right? So the classical Bregman distance requires the strict convexity. And this is what we cannot do without in our brief in our proof. So we require the operator T to be strictly monotone. So this is, this comes from the general theory. But we require strictly monotone, not everywhere, just in the intersection of the domains, right? So you just need this strict monotonicity over this set. And what happens is that, of course, with, the, with this tending to zero, these minimizers will converge to y somehow. So they converge weakly to y. And this property here is the same that happens in the general theory. So even for Moreau envelopes, it happens that the envelope approaches the value of, of the function from below when gamma tends to zero. The values of theta uh, the minimizers also converge to theta of y. And as we, as we see, not only the distances tend to zero, but they tend to zero faster than gamma. So this is what happens for the asymptotic results in the case in which gamma tends to zero. And note that we are using here the sharp distance and the with respect to the first coordinate. So this, this function is convex. So there is a lot of convex analysis that can still be used in here. So don't feel scared because this uses mainly convex analysis. Okay, so let me go to the other asymptotic behavior, which is the case in which gamma tends to plus infinity. And again, similar, similar assumptions as before, but the difference is that now we request theta to be coercive. So in this case, when gamma tends to infinity and S gamma are the minimizers, what we have is as follows. So let's, let's first think about what is going on. Gamma is tending to infinity and gamma is in the denominator of the distance. Therefore, the distance becomes less and less prominent when gamma tends to infinity. So who is prominent now is going to be theta, the convex, the convex function. So this means that when gamma tends to infinity, what we will have is that the value of our envelope will converge, will be decreasing to the infimum value of theta over the domain of T. This is really what was happening for classical Bregman distances. So in classical Bregman distances, you use the envelope sometimes to minimize your function theta over the domain of your Bregman function. So suppose that your Bregman function has the domain, the, the positive orcant, then you use the, the break, that Bregman distance to automatically impose the constraints of your optimization problem. And you can do this exactly in the same way with this generalized distance where your constraint set is now going to be the domain of T. So instead of having to choose a convex function and the convex function that has for domain your constraint set, you can choose any maximally monotone operator that has for domain your constraint set and still get the same good effect of the envelopes approximation. And this is a, a figure that produced by Scott Lindstrom and about the comparison of the envelope. So suppose that you have this function, this, this is our function theta now, the modulus of 
t minus one. Yeah? So this is the function. So this is the minimum point. Minimum value, of course, is zero. And here, this is when gamma tends to infinity, and this is when gamma tends to zero. Now, when gamma tends to zero, of course, we approach our function from below, and this is confirmation of what we saw in our theorem. And when gamma tends to infinity, the value converges to the minimum value of our function, which is zero, right? So they are, broadly speaking, they, they satisfy the same properties. However, as we see from the theory, this regularization here is smaller than the regularization produced, of course, by the financial Young case. And now let's look at this definition again and further extend the, de the definition that we have seen with a single operator. So just look at here. So here we have T, right? So we have a maximally monotone operator T. And in the previous definition, what we had is V in T of Y here. So here instead, of v in s of y, we have t v in t of y. So the, the upper operator and the, the operator below were exactly the same operators, right? But when you look at this, you are taking the supremum and the infimum over a given set. There is no reason for which you use, you should use the same operator here. So this is why we take a general point to set operator as a lower operator and produce further cases of generalized Bregman distances. And we will see later on that it is really necessary to take two operators if we want to have nice examples of applications. So I will, I will show you next how we can use these generalized distances with two operators to characterize approximate solutions of variational problems. So again, if you use the supremum, you will have the sharp version. If you use the infimum, you will have the flat version. So these are the, this is the last generalization I will show you today. But again, you would say, what is the point? So what are these distances telling me? What is the interpretation of this distance? So remember, let me go back a little bit. Remember that in the case of the Bregman distance, this is zero if and only if gradient of f of x is equal to gradient of f of y. So you have the equality between these two, these two images. Now what you would have is on one hand, you will have s of y, sorry, not, so on, on one half, you will have s of x, sorry, s of y, and on the other, you will have t of x. So if they were point to point, you would have this equality here. But when you extend it to point to set, there are different types of overlap between two sets. The milder type of over overlap if when the, is when the two sets intersect. And that gives you one interpretation, the interpretation for the flat distance. And when you have the strong overlap that the set S of Y is a subset of T of X, then you have the interpretation corresponding to the sharp distance. And of course, remember that when you take the level sets, then you get approximate versions of this conditions. And remember that many, many conditions in variational analysis are written in terms of the intersection of sets, or they are written in terms of inclusion of sets. So all, when we, all, and, and the approximate versions as well, because having approximate versions is even more important than having the exact version, because sometimes the exact version is so difficult, you cannot deal with it. But this distance gives you the possibility of expressing this in an approximate way and also eventually 
tractable way. Let's see some examples. I, I will try to go through this a, a, a little bit quickly, but it's important that we try to play with these concepts a little bit more to understand what they mean. So a, a simple case is a case in which the operators are linear and maximally monotone. So this means if, if you have a linear operator that is maximally monotone, this essentially means that this inequality is greater than or equal to zero for every x, even though this a may not be symmetric, right? So the linear operator is not symmetric. And the maximality means that these operators are continuous. So these are continuous operators. So when we want to define the Breckman distance associated with these operators, we need, of course, so in this particular case, we will look at the Fitzpatrick distance. So we will look at the distance generated by the Fitzpatrick function, which according to the definition is this expression. And here the sharp and the flat cases collapse because we have point to point case. So in the point to point case, all, them, all of them, both of them collapse to the same definition. And uh, fortunately, again, thanks to Bauske, Wang, Yao, and Bauske, Borwin, and, and Wang, we have that they have computed the Fitzpatrick function for any linear maximally monotone operator. And this linear maximally monotone operator is computed in terms of the essential conjugate of the quadratic function associated with the linear operator. So every linear operator has a quadratic function associated, which is this. And then you take the adjoint of A, which in finite dimensions is the transpose of A, which satisfies this well-known property from linear algebra. And then you define the essential function associated with this operator A as two times the facial conjugate of this quadratic function in some kind of corrected average of the point x and u. So the average between x and u, which is in the domain of the function, is average using the adjoint of a. So you produce this function, and this is the Fitzpatrick function. And using this very nice definition, we have that our Fitzpatrick distance for these two operators, A and B. And in fact, here B can be anything, doesn't need to be, doesn't need to be linear. B can be any any point-to-point -point map, can be written in this way, where the only thing I have done here is I just have replaced, I just have used the definition of the Fitzpatrick function. And if A is symmetric, which in this context means that A is equal to A star, and the range of A is a closed subspace, then this distance, this distance here, becomes either plus infinity when B of, a, B of I is very far from the range, or when B of I is in the range, is equal to this quadratic expression of Z minus the scalar product. And this uh, quadratic expression, this Z zero here, are all the points such that when I apply A to those points, I get exactly the average between A of X and B of Y. So this is a nice, beautiful property. And this is the smallest of those distances. And the largest of the, that distance is a very pathological case, which is zero only when the two sets are exactly equal. Otherwise, it is plus infinity. So by this delta, by this delta, we mean here something which is equal to zero if x is in C and plus infinity in contrary case. So this is the indicator function of the set zero in B by minus AX. So this gives you the whole, and the whole family is between these two, these two elements. So this gives you an idea of what the Fitzpatrick family generates. So this, these are the types of distances generated by the whole Fitzpatrick family are between these two examples. So just playing a little bit more, 
if uh, if you have a skew a skew matrix which is a star equal minus a and this is this is a very pathological case in which both distances collapse to the indicator function of the difference and the other case is when the operator a is a multiple of the identity a positive multiple of the identity of course and in that case the Fitzpatrick distance that you obtain is simply a multiple of the quadratic dl2 distance of ax minus b bar. So you can get very badly behaved things or very nicely behaved things according to your choice of the operator. Again, we are using examples of this paper by Bowski, Baldwin, and Wine in the computation of these distances. And in, just to show you an example in which the range of the operator is not the whole space. So suppose that you have the operator AX is just the projection over the first coordinate and B is anything, any any point to point map. Then the associated distance, the Fitzpatrick distance gives you the quadratic distance in wherever the function A is the identity then it gives you the quadratic distance. And then when the function A is zero, so the, the, the second part gives you the, the, the pathological part. Let's see. So it, this is going to be plus infinity unless the second coordinate of B is ex exactly equal to the second coordinate of A. So you can mix, mix up the well-behaved part with the pathological part if you want. Anyway, so just this is just a plain up. And now, I, 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 if I have time, I will speak about a little bit about the continuity property. So when you have at hand a new distance, you would like to understand what are the continuity properties of this distance, right? So we will look at the continuity properties on the first variable and under some conditions on the operator T and just want to mention that these conditions of weekly closeness in finite dimensions means that the, ima the, the images of S are closed are necessary because for, for example, for the flat distance, we take the infimum. So we take the infimum, so we need to take nets or sequences. So we need to deal with some closeness properties some attainment properties. So we need some closeness properties for the operator who is over which we are taking the infimum or the supremum. So in this case, we can show that the flat distance is lower semi-continuous on the interior of the domain of T. And for the sharp distance, which is the supremum, we do not need to have any additional information on S to obtain the exactly the same lower semi-continuity property. And this is a nice exercise of functional analysis because we need to use the Eberlein Smullian theorem, which characterizes weakly compact sets in terms of sequences. So this is a, an important part of the proof. Now let's look at the second variable, what happens in the second variable. So again, we need some close set, closeness and boundedness assumptions on the operator S. And using those assumptions, we obtain that for every X in the domain, the flat version is lower semi-continuous on the second variable. So here we need that the graph to be close with respect to the strong and weak topology. I think Andrew is going to speak to us about subsets of X times X star, which are, which are, which have these topological properties. And also we need the local boundedness of X in the interior of the domain. I don't remember if I mentioned what this means. This just means that for every X that you take in the interior of the domain, you can find the neighborhood of that point such that S applied to that neighborhood gives you a bounded set. So that's called locally bounded. And under these technical assumptions, you can, you can show the lower semi-continuity 
of the flat version of the distance. And <clears throat> just wanted to mention that all these assumptions are true for the classical Bregman distance. So we, we can derive those types of lower semi-continuity properties for the classical Bregman distance. And when, when this, uh, this lower semi-continuity was, we, when we were not able to prove this lower semi-continuity, we were able to find counterexample for those cases. Okay, so now we spoke about the general properties of these distances and I gave you some examples, but I haven't been able to really tell you how are these new tools going to be useful for anything, right? So we are going to look at the inclusion problem. So the inclusion problem is a model for many, for practically every problem in variational analysis can be modeled as an inclusion problem, going from optimization models to variational inequalities to fixed point problems, etc. So they, this all can be modeled in this way, where u is a fixed element in the dual space. So given this u, you would like to find an x such that this inclusion is true. And if t is a maximally monotone operator, this might be quite a difficult problem to solve. Right, so you you may want to, con to to solve some approximation of this problem. You may want to replace t by a better conditioned operator s. So this s here is an operator of your choice. You choose it, and it should be something that you can solve. Right, so you take the same u. And you replace your original problem p t by this problem p s. Find me a y such that u is in S of y. So because S has been chosen by you and you know how to solve this problem with S and not with T, then you solve it with S and you obtain a y, right? Now you take this y fixed and try to pose the problem of finding the x's that satisfy this inequality for epsilon and non-negative number, right? So this is a convex feasibility problem because y is fixed and h is convex on x. So then you can, you can take x that satisfies this inequality. And is this meaningful? How, in which way is this going to be meaningful with respect to the original problem you started with? Well, if you find this x, then no matter which, which h in ht you use, this x will always be a solution of this approximating problem in which instead of t, you have the enlargement of t, t e. So t e with the parameter epsilon at the point x is the set of all v's in the dual space such that they satisfy this this inequality with respect to every other point in the graph. And instead of having zero here, we have minus epsilon. Just let me tell you that if you would have zero here, then this would imply that V is in T of X. But if you don't have zero, but you have a minus epsilon, this implies that this V is in some set which contains T of X, right? So this set here, contains and might be different than t of x. And therefore, this is called an enlargement of t for epsilon positive. For epsilon equal to zero, it is exactly equal to t. For epsilon greater than zero, in general, contains t of x. This means that because this, this contains t of x, this is some kind of, let's say, necessary optimality condition for the general problem, right? So if you have a solution of the original problem, then that solution will be a solution of this problem here, right? So this means that you can use this as some kind of necessary optimality condition of the inclusion problem. And because this, this generalized, this approximating problem contains the solution of all these problems, contains 
these solutions, and in fact, no, it's, it's on the opposite. So if X solves this, then you solve this approximating problem. So you can be sure that by solving this convex feasibility problem, you are approximating the original problem. So I hope I convince you that these distances might be useful. And now I will look at a particular case of the previous situation. Suppose that T is again maximally monotone and S is any point to set map. You consider the sum set. So you consider zero in the sum of T plus S. Again, this is a very important model for variational problems. And again, we will use an enlargement of T. So remember that this is equal to zero if and only if V is in T of X, right? So this set here contains T of X. So the sets of V such that, such that this inequality is true gives you a set that contains T of X. So that somehow this is an, another type of enlargement of T. And the only difference is that we need to use H in the Fitzpatrick family to be able to define this enlargement of T. So this is another way of defining an enlargement of T, now using an arbitrary element in the Fitzpatrick family. Now then we have two statements. The first statement is a statement that tells me that zero belongs to LH epsilon dot plus S of X. So this is an enlargement of T plus S, right? So this is an approximate solution. So this is an approximate solution of zero in T plus S of X. And when you look at this, we can say that This condition is an, this <clears throat> inclusion is a necessary condition of optimality for, for this inequality. So now here we are using the flat distance and we are using the operator minus s as the lower operator and we are using x, x. So here what happens is that if you have a solution of this inclusion, then this inequality is true. This means that this inequality is a necessary condition of optimality for this approximated problem. And moreover, under some technical assumptions on S, so if you choose your S judiciously, if you choose your S intelligently, then the two statements are equivalent, right? So this is another way of using this time the flat distance as a characterization of approximate solutions. And the last example I will talk to you about is optimality conditions for difference of convex functions. So suppose that you have two convex functions and G is a finite, finite convex function, then it is well known at least in finite dimensions, it is, it is well known that a global minimum of a DC problem, unconstrained, is that for every epsilon, and this is a very beautiful, I think that maybe one of the most beautiful optimality conditions I have seen. So a global minimum of this difference, if and only for every epsilon, you have this inclusion between the epsilon subdifferentials, right? And this condition is equivalent to this condition in terms of this inequality in terms of the sharp distance, where our function H is the facial Young function. So we go back to known terrain, but the lower, the lower mapping S is not monotone, is precisely the epsilon subdifferential. So this is an example in which the lower operator of this distance is the epsilon subdifferential. And this is a characterization of an unconstrained minimum of this difference. 
of course, this, this equivalence is well known in finite dimensions. In infinite dimensions, Scott and, and Min and I couldn't find it, so we proved it again in infinite, in, in reflexive Banach spaces. So I finished all that I wanted to say. And uh, again, I will, I will put some questions here. I would really love for people to, to go and uh, work with these distances and get, and get interesting results. So, but the floor is open for people to, to see whether we can uh, generate new techniques for solving variation and inequalities or even DC problems. Or even in, this, in the case in which both operators are the subdifferential and we get the Fitzpatrick distance, can we use the Fitzpatrick distance to get new results or to get some insight uh, in the same way as Bregman distances give us insight in terms of Bregman projections, in terms of Bregman envelopes. Bregman distances are not only useful computationally, but also theoretically. They have a very important role in analysis of methods, as Javier Peña has showed to us in his very beautiful talk yesterday. He, he showed us how, to, how we can use Bregman distances to analyze and unify the, the convergence analysis of many algorithms. So are these distances going to have a, new, a, a similar role theoretically and computationally? And this is, of course, up to, up to you and whoever wants to use these distances in their research. But uh, another, another important conclusion of this is the, the incredible and beautiful link between convex analysis and maximally monotone operators. So convex functions appear naturally when we study maximally monotone operators, right? But moreover, when, when you look at some notions which apparently don't involve any maximally monotone operator, you can discover them. You can discover those maximally monotone operators rising from inside of the, of the concepts that originally only involve convex functions. And uh, okay, so this is all I wanted to say. And these are the three papers. The, this is the, the original paper with Juan Enrique uh, on 2018. And these are the papers with Min and Scott, and in, in this paper here, we looked at coercivity properties of these distances. And here we looked at the proximity operators and Bregman generalized envelopes. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, can we, uh, uh, we're now available to have uh, questions uh, for Regina. Uh, so um, yes, Bethany, Bethany, you were the first with a hand up. Would you like to ask for a question? Sorry, I was just clapping. <laughs> oh, you're just clapping. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, is there anybody who'd like to ask a question? Um, while you're thinking, I'll, I've got a couple of questions to ask Regina. Mm -hmm. um, but first of all, um, um, when, when you have a, uh, uh, a subdifferential of a convex function f and you, you know, the natural uh, you know, uh, representative function is f plus its conjugate, of course, that's an auto conjugate representer. And, uh, you know, in, in, in reflexive spaces, uh, uh, Heinz Bausch actually gave a uh, explicit formula how to get an autoconjugate representative function from the Fitzpatrick function. So uh, mm -hmm. I was just wondering, uh, in the case when you've got your skew symmetric operators, possibly, I mean, I just want this is a, a suggestion, possibly one could investigate autoconjugate representers as being kind of a halfway house between extremes. And get something that's more more aligned with the classical Bregman distance. If you followed through with that as the kind of seed for your your generalized distance. But uh, so you mean the the case in which a is linear and a is q, like for example the rotation, the pi over two rotation. Yeah, if you got a skew symmetric, which well, is, in which that, is the differential, yeah. But in that case, I I don't see really how the theory can can provide something new because the problem is that when you have a skew symmetric operator, there, you cannot enlarge it. So there is no enlargement no, no, you're for, right. for that operator. 
And if you don't have any enlargement, so the, every enlargement coincides with the operator. This means that the only element in the family is the operator itself. So you, you, you cannot really get out from that. Yeah. So think about the rotation, pi over two rotation. So the pi over two rotation, you have the domain times the codomain, but if, you are, if you, your codomain, you are rotating pi over two, then the product is zero. So you will get over, always zero when you do the scalar yeah, code. Not, right? not enlargeable. Yeah, so you, yeah. you, you won't be able yeah. to enlarge in that case. That's the most pathological case. So yeah. when you, you will see the result of this theory is going to be fruitful if you take an operator which is far from being symmetric. Do you think there's any any role for the sort of auto conjugates as a tool in this, or do you think that? Yes, of course, of course. Yeah. So uh, in in the case, so the as you as you were saying, so as you were saying, the the facial young function f plus f star. It's, a, it's an autoconjugate function because when you conjugate, you obtain the same, the same function. And uh, this has a role in the family, in the Fitzpatrick family, because the conjugation has a role. The conjugation in convex analysis has the role of inverting the order. So when you have the two functions, one smaller than the other, and you conjugate, the, in, the inequality uh, becomes the opposite one. So you go from one part of the Fitzpatrick family to the opposite part of the Fitzpatrick family. And the, the, the role of the, of the autoconjugates tells you the role of the elements in the Fitzpatrick family, which are similar to the epsilon subdifferential, because the epsilon subdifferential is the enlargement which is associated with the facial young function. So when the facial young function is less than the scalar product plus epsilon, then you have an element in the epsilon subdifferential. So that's the characterization of the epsilon subdifferential. So you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the epsilon subdifferential and the facial young function. But when you go to the area of maximally monotone operators, then you look at autoconjugates as the functions that can give you something which is similar to the epsilon subdifferential. And I have a paper with uh, Michel Terra, Juan Enrique, and, uh, and Magube Resaye, in which we show conditions under which you can find in the Fitzpatrick family, the autoconjugate elements. So which are the elements for which you can have the similarity with the epsilon subdifferential. And one of the important similarities that the epsilon subdifferential has, and many other enlargements do not have, is the additivity property. So the, the epsilon enlargement is additive in the sense that if you combine an element in epsilon one enlargement with another in the epsilon two enlargement, then the whole scalar product is greater than minus epsilon one minus epsilon two. So it has some additivity property. And, and you can characterize that property in terms of autoconjugate representatives. Mm. Well, th so, thank you for that, uh, Regina. Welcome. Do we have any other um, uh, questions? Matt, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Regina, for a very interesting tour. Um, one of the identities that often pops up when you're working with the Bregman divergence to analyze the algorithms is the four-point identity. Uh, so mm -hmm. this is the one that has, it has a number of terms, but there are Bregman mm -hmm. uh, distances. And then the mm -hmm. only other sort of term that appears is a in a product which involves the gradient mm -hmm. of the Bregman function. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have an analog uh, for the generalized Bregman divergence for that? Unfortunately, not, but uh, be because, you know, the Bregman distance has this very nice property that the function that you use, which is the facial young function, is separable. Mm -hmm. So that makes it very, very amenable to computations and uh, to analysis. So 
in, in, in as you said, so this uh, four point property is very important, for example, in the analysis of generalized proximal point methods where you use the, the Bregman distance instead of the, the quadratic distance. So it's, it has a fundamental property. And uh, we do not have, or so as far as, as I know, I don't know of any example in which you can extend that property to a function h, which is not the Fenchel Young function, as far as I know. Okay, so it's it's because of the separability of the function that it boils down. Yes, to because of the separability. If you look at the proof, the proof is very elementary, and it uses the fact that you have the the f plus f star there, so mm -hmm. you it's separable. And it has so many nice properties. I mean, the Fenchelian has so many nice properties. But on the other hand, you have the Fitzpatrick, and Fitzpatrick is smaller than the Fenchelian. So it might be useful in some situations, but not in that one. <laughs> that one, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Uh, do we have another question? Um, Yes, Yang, go ahead. Uh, hey, uh, Regina. Yeah, I have a- Hello, Xiao Qi. It's so nice to see you, Xiao Qi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have an um, application of this uh, summation of the uh, two operators. And uh, the second one is the uh, uh, monotone operator. So in that case, um, this monotone operator uh, can respond into a convex function uh, in general sense. So in that case, it, it, your uh, application can respond into the uh, summation of a general function plus a convex function. Or, or for example, first function can be small, then the second function is uh, convex. But because you have a monotone plus uh, another uh, point to set mapping. Uh, yes, uh, for example, suppose that S is, uh, S is the gradient of a function, which is differentiable, but not necessarily convex. And T... Uh, yeah, it's something else. Just, just something, is something else. else. Yeah, but my mm -hmm. question is about the, the S. Uh, so convex, the, 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 the S function can respond to the convex function is one uh, contains many applications, but there are more general application where the, uh, the, the, the function corresponding to S is not a convex. So in that case, S is mm -hmm. not a monotone. Yes, in this case, S is not monotone. So uh, S I is any point to say my... If there is any uh, literature, any study, uh, for, for, for example, uh, the, for, going beyond the convex function, there is a class of the um, quasi-convex function. Now, quasi-convex function can, can respond to quasi-monotone in some sense. Mm. So I wonder if there is kind of possibility or there is some kind of result if, if this S, S uh, point to set the value function uh, mapping is kind of quasi-monotone. Or if you uh, uh, this kind of uh, Borgman distance can be extended to the uh, uh, quasi monotone uh, case. Look, uh, I, I don't know of any existing yeah. application because this, this is quite new. This is particular example was published this year. But as you say, so for example, if you take T like Suppose that T is maximally monotone. So suppose that T is the, a, a gradient or a subdifferential. Then here you can take the epsilon subdifferential of the function f plus an s of x, and this s of x you can choose it as, as you as you like. So for example, s can be quasi convex. Uh, sorry, not quasi convex, quasi monotone, etc. And so you can have a, a problem of this type, and you can you can look at it by using if, if you have point-to-point -point maps, for example, you can you can use this type of of condition to define an algorithm that converges to a solution. 
right? So in this case, you would still have a point to set map because you will have a, an epsilon sub differential, but you could define an algorithm that converges to a solution of the original problem. Yes, you could you could do it. I mean, I don't know how easy or difficult the analysis of that would yeah, be. I don't know if it's, but you yeah. could you you could think of something like that. Yes. Yeah, there, there are models uh, in uh, machine learning where uh, the one of the function is quasi convex. And the okay, other, you. <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah, the other is can be differentiable, yeah. Differentiable. Okay. Uh, ah, uh, I see, uh, I see. So you, uh, you don't. Convex. For okay, example, so... this uh, LQ norm, LQ norm can be quasi convex. Yes, but in that case, there is no maximal monotone operator in your model. Yeah, yeah, yes. So uh, uh, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Thanks, Sachi. Uh, so I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, uh, Regina, we're kind of starting to go into your second hour where we're going to do your tutorial. We can take maybe one last uh, round of questions or move on to the second portion of your presentation. You are the chair. Okay. Andrew. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I, I propose we, uh, we move on and uh, have a look at... Uh, the, uh, the second part, which is um, really a survey of enlargements and properties and applications.